not here yet. That is correct. Okay. Chair Holland, it's six o'clock. Would you like me to start with the Zoom instructions or would you like to get started first? No, go ahead with the um, instructions. Oh, it's Trustee Wake is the one person we're looking for. So I'll try to keep an eye out for her. But yes, she just do. entered. Trustee Wake just entered. Okay, okay good that. evening. Uh, this is Hatton Littman, the communications director speaking. Welcome to the board meeting. I'm just going to give you a few tips and tricks for using Zoom, and then we'll get started with the official meeting. If it's your first time joining Zoom, there's a couple important controls. If you take your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you'll notice on the far left, there's a icon that looks like a microphone and it says mute. That's how you'll control what we see and hear from you tonight. If you could keep yourself muted until you're speaking for public comment, that would be very helpful. And if you accidentally unmute yourself, I can mute you again. And you can turn your video on and off as well with the little camera icon or stop video. In the center of the screen, you'll notice that there's an icon that looks like a comic book thought bubble and it says chat. You'll be able to chat me as the host in case you have questions or technical support. Chat is not a place for public comment. The trustees will not see your comment if you place it there. So please just only chat if you need help with something in the meeting tonight. If you'd like to raise your hand to make public comment, there are two possible ways you could do that. Zoom just went through a little bit of a software update. So depending upon what version of Zoom you are running, on the bottom right hand side of your screen, you might see a little happy face and it says reactions. If you click on that happy face, you'll notice that there are a wide variety of reactions and one of them says raise hand. That's how you'll raise your hand to be called on for public comment. If you're on an old version of Zoom, you might need to click on the button that says participants and it'll open a big white window and list all the people that are in the meeting. At the bottom of that white window is a little button that says raise hand. If you're joining from the phone, you're going to press star nine to raise your hand. And then when we call on you, you'll press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Chair Holland to start the meeting. Thank you. And just to, to let everyone know at a certain point, I'll probably be um, turning off my video to save some bandwidth tonight, but it doesn't mean I've left the meeting. It just means I wanna be able to make sure I can participate through the whole meeting. And so with that, I'll call the meeting to order. I will welcome everyone. I will take roll call, but I see on the screen that we have all 11 trustees present. So I won't do individual roll call because we're all here. And then we'll go on to number two, which is the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm not sure if we have a plague available. Oh, there's the plague. So um, Dr. Watson, would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and Number three on the agenda is to review, revise, and approve the agenda as it's been set. Is there any requests from any trustee to modify the agenda as it's been set? Just go ahead and raise a hand visually or electronically. And I'll look for any hands being raised. So seeing none, we'll go ahead and follow the agenda as it's been set. The next item, item number four, is to approve the minutes. It is from the regular board meeting of January 12th, 2021. Is there any request from any trustee to make any modification to the minutes as they appear as an attachment to our agenda? Again, I'm looking for either hands raised visually or virtually. Not seeing any hands raised, then is there a motion to approve the minutes from the January 12th board meeting? Moved so moved. Matt Garrison, seconded by trustee McDonald. 
Um, all trustees in favor of approving the minutes from January 12th board meeting, please indicate by raising your hand. And Trustee Vogel, if you don't mind um, unmuting and mm -hmm. electronically or on the phone. Yep, Vogel is yes. So those minutes are approved unanimously. Then we move on to public comment on non-agenda items. Those are the items that we will not be discussing tonight. We offer opportunities at the beginning and end of our board meetings for public comment on non-agenda items for anything that members of the public would like to bring to the board's attention. Um, the basic ground rules are please identify yourself with your first and last name and spell your first or last name or both if either of them have an unusual spelling. If you represent an organization, please identify that organization. And we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. And so Hatton will assist us all in letting everyone know when those three minutes are passing by. And to let you know, as you raise your hand to make public comment on non-agenda items, you appear in the participants list in a queue which indicates the first person to raise their hand would be the one I'd call on first and so on. And so we'll just go through the queue on public comment on non-agenda items. And with that, is there any public comment on non-agenda items? And I'll be looking for virtual hands raised. And Hatton will be helping. So far, I am not seeing anyone virtually raising their hand. I'm just going to page through in case somebody is raising their hand visually. I right. don't and see that either. And if there's anyone on the phone who wants to make public comment on an agenda item, I, I think the process would be you'd have to unmute yourself. Oh, it looks like uh, Kelly McDonald wants to make public comment on an agenda item. Go ahead, Kelly McDonald. Go ahead and unmute. Good evening. My name is Kelly McDonald. My last name is spelled M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. And I want to first acknowledge that in Missoula, um, Missoula schools, Missoula City is in the traditional homelands of the Salish people. And I would like to acknowledge the land and I would like to acknowledge that um, pay my respect and humility to all of the indigenous people in the state that we now call Montana. Um, I listened to the last meeting and I wanted to inform that I've read an article that is entitled, The Reopen Schools Now Debate is Rooted in Racism. And this is by Rochelle Chase. I read this article and I thought it was very well written. And I wanted to say that I think we need to read articles like this and listen to people who are talking about systemic racism. Um, the article said, quote, we see white and affluent parents leveraging the plight of historically underserved children as justification to reopen schools now while actively excluding the communities they claim to be advocating for from the conversation. And I was particularly, I took particular note that there was no BIPOC people on the um, COVID task force. And I thought that was a problem. Um, I listened to trusty old person talking about othering that was happening. I listened to Dr. Belcourt talking about the higher chances of Native Americans dying from COVID. And she said, you don't wanna lose someone to this virus. She said she already lost someone, an aunt who was an educator. I have a lot to say, I don't know. I'll try to, I'll try to stop, but um, I was troubled by the increased risk of harm to teachers being something that is worth doing don't think that that's right. Um, I think that the health and safety of teachers is the utmost importance right now. And I don't think that's fair of a, trust, a trustee to say, 
that we're asking teachers to go in harm's way, but we should do it. I wanted to say that the first thing I, or the very first thing that I did, and I've done at previous meetings called a land acknowledgement is something that you should look into and possibly do it for your meetings. Um, it's respectful. I think there's differing opinions, but I think it's respectful. And I don't think it should be a checkbox that you check off. I think you should understand what it is and consider starting to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on any non-agenda item? I'll look for hands raised. And again, if you're on the phone, you'd have to unmute yourself and let us know you'd like to make public comment. Hatton, I don't think I see any hands raised, at least according to the participants list. That's correct. Okay, then we'll move on. There's correspondence in the um, attached to the agenda. And the next item is six, which is our community connection. And so Dr. Watson, do you want to introduce um, the two presenters about this in informative presentation? And then we'll turn it over to them. I will. Yes. Thank you, Chair Holland. And thanks for those that are on the uh, Zoom this evening. I know there's a lot of members of our iValue working group that are on the Zoom this evening. So appreciate you being here. Um, this is a, a project that was actually started pre-COVID. Um, and it's sometimes it's hard to think about, you know, what what's really critically important in the middle of this pandemic. And I understand that. Um, but this, uh, this is a topic that's of utmost importance, not only to me as the superintendent of, uh, of the school district, but also for our, for our community um, within the district. What I really appreciate about this work is it involves quite a few different uh, stakeholders within our community. And I know Hatton will talk about that. Um, Hatton and Daisha um, both will be leading the presentation to you this evening. Uh, both are serving as co-leaders or co-facilitators for this group, um, and they're doing some great work, uh, but the, they also have several other members of the group that are on the call. So um, Hatton, I think I'll just turn it over to you if that's okay, or maybe Daisha, either one. Thank you. I think Daisha is going to take it from here. Thank you. I'm Daisha Griego. I'm a Native American education specialist um, with MCPS, Native American Student Services Department, formerly the Indian Education Department. Um, and I'm happy to be here this evening to share with you about the work that our group is doing. Um, so I'm going to present uh, my screen. Okay, so um, first I value is the name of our working group um, and it is an acronym. It stands for inclusion, validation, action and appreciation, learning, understanding and equity. The working group's purpose is to help MCPS move forward with creating a more inclusive workplace and school setting. Um, we recognize that our community needs to learn skills in order to be aware of and interrupt bias. Um, whether that's related to race, national origin, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, creed, citizenship status, ability, economic or social conditions, or marital or parental status. Specifically, we want all staff and students to help make MCPS a safe, respectful, and responsible uh, learning environment for all of our staff and students. We know that when one person or group is oppressed, we're all harmed. Equity is about improving everyone's lives and not just those who are marginalized. So by dismantling oppression in our community, we lift oppressive expectations from everyone. Uh, providing safe and inclusive learning environments where young people are able to explore and develop their identities, leadership skills, and critical thinking around issues of oppression and societal change is critical in helping to prepare them to be lifelong advocates for equity, which is um, a goal that we should all have. 
Um, research has shown that most people are drawn to what's familiar to them, what's comfortable, and without positive intervention, um, environments are unlikely to become diverse or at least unlikely to evolve at a reasonable, pa a reasonable pace in that direction without a little nudge. Um, so yeah, a little bit of background. Um, as Rob stated, the group did start um, last year. So um, we've been receiving students and families feedback for years about experiences of discrimination and concerns about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so we're grateful for a superintendent who prioritizes this work and asks for this group to be formed. Um, members of the group include professionals in the field of anti-bias and racial justice work, and many more were recruited to represent the MCPS community as a whole. Um, the group worked for about three months to brainstorm and plan action um, that would be made by the group, and then, of course, the pandemic hit and that work was paused. Um, this fall, we resumed um, with Hatton and I uh, being co-leaders. Um, co-facilitators of the group, and we have created the following priorities for the school year um, that I'll share. So priority one, all future work should have a primary focus on centering the experience and growing the leadership of specific groups within the district, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, members of the LGBTQIA plus community, members of various religious communities, individuals who speak a language other than English or who come from other countries, and individuals who experience economic, physical, or developmental hardships. Uh, priority two is that a leadership team should be established that includes those with experience and expertise in anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and inclusion training and work. Um, so while Hatton and I are helping to kind of lead and organize, um, I value is really a team of experts that are um, helping all of this come to be. Um, so number three is uh, to create a cohort of allies and supporters that will be the first group to go through anti-bias training. Um, and then they would act as leaders within our MCPS community in implementing social change within our community, um, within the district, and within their home schools. And then four, um, identify and take action on known issues while concurrently planning, training, and research. Um, so while we understand that planning and research are a vital part of this work, we also want to identify and take action on known issues within the district and not wait for years and years for action to happen. Um, so one idea that we've had is to create a district-wide response to re reports of discrimination or oppression. Um, at this time, when a report is made, the outcome is in the hands of administration at that school. And this leads to inconsistent response to really serious issues. Um, our hope is to create a system that is both transparent and consistent across the district. Um, and then last, I'd like to share a our timeline. So um, we have been working hard all fall and we're really excited to roll out the first series of anti-bias trainings this spring. Um, so this will, week we'll be um, confirming with some presenters and are really excited to start a training um, in March or April with that first group of allies um, within the district. And then they will, um, at the end of that training be hopefully um, able to take action within their schools or organizations and the district. Um, and then we're also along the same time frame, March or April, um, we are doing research. So Katie Coster of Rattlesnake Elementary School is reading the is leading the data and research team. Um, and so while we want to take action um, and the district's call to action started around climate and culture issues, we also have to look deeply at issues of equity that may occur in our academic outcomes, our discipline, attendance, and behavioral trends. So those are all things that are being gathered at this time. And then in the March or April um, timeframe is when we hope to have an initial review of all that data that's been gathered. Um, the last few months of this school year, um, we will be spending time to create an action plan for next school year. Um, so this is going to be an ongoing process. It's not going to be just um, 
a one-time thing that we consider. It's going to be um, each school year. And um, in the 2021-2022 um, school year, our goal is to train 150 staff, faculty, and board members um, in this anti-bias training. Um, so this is our goal overall, but one of the most important things that we need is an enabling context. And what we mean by that is we need um, readiness among staff, board, and community members to undertake these topics. Uh, we need funding, and we need accountability measures to keep us on track with this work. Um, so with that, we'd like to take questions from the board. Um, and then we would also like to take a minute to um, introduce the members of our iValue team. A lot of them are here today. So if you want to introduce the members first, then I'll see if any trustees have any questions for you or committee members or including Hatton. Yeah, Hatton, do you want to start? Yeah, I sure will. I want to say thank you so much, not only for their participation here tonight, but for all of these folks participation since last year and their just deep, deep commitment to our work. So I'm going to go in order of where I can see you on my screen. Jenny, uh, excuse me, Rabbi Lori Franklin from Har Shalom. Jenny Malloy, a teacher at Russell Elementary School. Katie Coster, a teacher at Rattlesnake Elementary School. Natalie Jager, principal at Meadow Hill. Crystal Thompson, a counselor at the Missoula Online Academy this year, but previously at um, Russell, I think. Nope, I got that wrong, sorry, Franklin. Um, Barbara Frank, principal at Lowell Elementary School. And I'm gonna page over because I think we have Jamar Galbraith and Heidi somewhere in here from Empower Montana, Heidi Wallace and Jamar Galbraith and Walina, uh, old person who is a trustee, but who is also participating on the iValue working group. Deisha, do you think I caught everyone? I think that's everyone who is in attendance and then just a few people who are not on the call um, right now that we also would like to acknowledge as being part of our um, group is Crystal Whiteshield, um, who is with Missoula Food Bank, um, Judson Miller with Hellgate High School, and then Jonathan Neff, who is a community member. Oh, thank you. So there are just two more things I wanted to say, if I may, Chair Holland. Sure. I want to highlight that one of the things that I have loved being a part of Missoula County Public Schools for the past eight years is that we find opportunities for teacher leadership and um, staff leadership and I value is no different there. So I want to really acknowledge our teachers who are really putting themselves front and center and especially the work of Daisha from our Native American Student Services Department and growing all of their leadership and their voices. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge our context in the community and how grateful I am. Many of the people that just got introduced are part of these, but to recognize that there are efforts underway within the city of Missoula, the county of Missoula, the Missoula Interfaith Collaborative, um, us with regard to public education, I think it's a, it's a great time to be a part of an awakening and especially concerted effort in Missoula around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we are not alone and there are a lot of interconnected webs and I appreciate that we can be a part of that. Thank you. And with that, are there any comments from any trustee or any questions to the committee? And it looks like Trustee Oldperson has her hand up. So go ahead, Trustee Oldperson. Thank you, Chair Holland. Um, and I just want to thank everybody on the iValue team. I know we started before COVID and it's really personal to me. And if I get a little emotional, it's because it's very personal to me. And that's where my passion comes from. Um, some people know the story of how I, be, how I chose to run and be elected for the school board. Um, it first started off with the elementary attendance boundary study that happened back in January 2019. So I was the Russell parent rep with um, Mrs. C asked me to be the Russell parent rep. So I joined the committee and um, throughout the four, four or five month process, I noticed the lack of involvement from communities of color 
here in Missoula at the open houses, at the meetings, anything like that, I was the only person of color. And that really stuck in my head. And I, this and this is something important, obviously it's important, but even just being in these in that space, I saw um, a lot of misinformation going around about our neighborhood schools, about certain neighborhoods, and that really bothered me. Um, as a parent, I my, my three little boys are Russell Bears. Um, and I think that really, cause that's one thing I really work for. My work history, my, the work I've done in this community has been to have the impact of one, to make an impact on someone because I got a lot of um, public comments back to me from the last school board meeting. Sorry, this is where I'm gonna get emotional. About, I was bringing up race. You're the only one talking about BIPOC, but it's in everything I do. If people look at me, I'm in the community and this is what they see. They see a brown person. Even if they don't see me, they see my last name. And so it's in everything I do and it impacts my children. That's why I do the work I do. And to say, to see that we're doing this is really important because I have children in our school district and my children have experienced discrimination. As a mother, you can't imagine having your child be told they don't belong, to have your child told by another MCPS student to go back to the res, that is not okay. So this work is important in the fact that people came at me and I know as an elected officials, people can at you but to come at me about race is not okay. And so I'm very excited and I knew I was gonna cry. I apologize, I don't take this as weakness. This is just my passion. And so I just want to thank everybody on this team. And I really encourage everybody in our community to do the work, do the work and not think of it always being about race because if you live in our shoes, you know the work needs to be done. Thank you. Thanks for those comments, Trustee Olperson. Is there any other comment or question from a trustee, either a comment or a question to any of the um, committee members? I'm just looking for hands up. Chair Holland, I don't see any hands up, but if we do have a moment and there's time, there may be a one or two members of our leadership team who may want to just give you a very brief statement about their commitment to this work and why they joined. Sure, so if we want any members of the public, which of course includes the members of the committee, if you wanna raise your hand um, and provide a, a brief comment, that would be really great. And I'll look to see. Or perhaps, oh, okay. Um, I don't wanna mispronounce a name, Rabbi Lori Franklin has their hand up, so go ahead. Thank you. I was not planning to speak tonight, but um, I was at a legislative hearing this morning where I was shut down twice by the chair of the meeting because I dared to speak the words white supremacy and racism. And it's such a relief to be in this space where we think this is a priority. And when Walina, old person, trustee, per, old person was speaking, I was in tears too. So I just want to share that. And I want to share that um, we can do wonders together if we work together. And my dream is that the children in this school district can be successful, that they can feel empowered, they can learn, they can grow, they can feel whole. And that's something that we can do together. So thank you so much for a moment to speak this. Thank you. Any other um, public comment or committee member comment? I'll just go Chair through. Holland, it looks like Crystal Thompson is raising her hand. Okay, um, Crystal Thompson, go ahead and unmute and provide a comment. Um, three minutes is typically the max, but we love hearing from you, so go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, neither was I planning on, on speaking. Um, I'm a counselor in the district, as was mentioned. I've also been an MCPS parent for 21 years. <laughs> um, we have seven children 
three of our kids are black. All of our children have experienced quality teachers, quality learning at MCPS. All of our children have also either experienced or observed prejudicial, prejudicial treatment as MCPS students. The work of this committee is timely. It is critical. We have to talk about uncomfortable things or it does not get better. I'm fortunate to be included in the work of the iValue team and I look forward to the support and engagement of the board and our MCPS stakeholders. And Walina, thank you for your brave words. Thank you for those comments. Are there any other public comment? Uh, looks, I can't get the whole last name. Hi, yeah, that's my first name actually. Um, I'm Ikusi Misukimaki. I've never actually attended one of these, um, but I heard about what the topic would be and I went to MCPS schools, kindergarten through um, 12th grade. And I'm just really glad to uh, see that there are some changes being made. I can say that there are lifelong effects of discrimination in schools and that I have had to spend a lot of my adulthood um, going to therapy and working through some of the things that I experienced in the MCPS school system as an indigenous person. Um, so I just wanted to thank Walina and um, yeah, just thank you all for finally coming up and doing this subject. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. I'm looking to see if anyone else has raised a hand who would like to make a comment. At this point, I don't see any other hands. Okay, well, thank you for that community connection. Thank you, especially to, to Hatton and Daisha. And thank you to trustee old person for being such an integral part of this. I don't know if the right word is movement, but the fact that we recognize as a district that there's a lot of work to be done in this area and that you are willing to be the leaders helping us all to begin this journey. I really appreciate hearing from you all. So thank you very much. And so with that, we'll go back to the agenda. And apologies, I'm just turning my page. Um, so we're on to item seven, which are three reports. The first is the health insurance trust fund report. The second one is the high school activities report from the fall of 2020, I believe, um, that we will see winter sports and then spring sports. So we'll see two additional reports um, connected with high school activities over the course of this academic year. And then the last item is announcements from Dr. Watson. So go ahead, Dr. Watson. Okay, well, thank you, Chair Holland, once again. Uh, just two announcements this evening. Something that I started at the last meeting to tell you about was our assessment procedure for this spring. So in addition to the assessments that um, Dr. Guest works on and, and uh, Amy Shattuck works on, we have district assessments. Dr. Guest does the um, work around ERLA and, um, and our other math assessment. Those are district assessments. And then um, we also have another district assessment called the STAR, which we've talked to you about before. Um, so those are, those are local assessments that we find very valuable in our work. Um, but there's also another assessment that happens at the state level, and that, that happens each spring. It's the Smarter Balanced Assessment, um, or some people call it SBAC for short. Um, it is a <clears throat> assessment that traditionally happens in the spring grades three through eight. Um, and then in high school, they do the ACT as the state assessment. Um, as I said last meeting, the ACT will happen this year um, for high school juniors. Um, in, I believe it's the second week or the first week of April. Um, but the other one that we're still sort of waiting word on is the state assessment, the assessment for grades three through eight. Um, it's an assessment that's given in reading and math every spring. Uh, obviously last spring, we did not give the assessment. The state um, received a waiver, so we didn't have to give that assessment. Uh, we are in the process of planning for that assessment this spring. Um, the state, however, um, is applying for another waiver from the federal government. Uh, we don't know if that'll be approved yet or not. If it is, then we would have the option um, of not doing that assessment. 
Um, however, um, in the absence of that waiver, we do have to plan for this assessment. The state has made some changes that I just want the board to be aware of. Um, they've expanded the testing window, which helps us. Um, they also will provide medical exemptions for COVID uh, reasons. So if a family can't be in the school setting for whatever reason uh, related to COVID, then there could be an exemption from the assessment. And they've also shortened the assessment because the assessment usually takes several days. Um, and so they've shortened the assessment just um, uh, for time's sake. Uh, what I do want the board to be aware of, though, is that the state is not allowing any remote um, participation in this assessment. So those students that are in the online academy wouldn't be able to participate in the state assessment um, unless we set up a time during the school day when they could come in the building to do the assessment, which is something we could consider as well. I, I just want to keep you all informed of that. Um, uh, and as, as soon as we know if the state has received a waiver for that assessment, I'll let you know that as well, but just want to keep you in the loop on the state assessment. And then the second thing I just wanted to talk briefly about is now that we've entered the legislative session, um, I think it is important to, to, for the board to be uh, kept in the loop or up, up to speed on various legislative issues. Uh, I talked with Chair Holland today, at perhaps about setting a time on our agenda when we could discuss uh, legislative issues. I do have one update that's uh, legislative related that I wanted to just make sure the board was aware of. It doesn't require any current action by the board, but I want you to be aware of this issue and, and likely we'll be talking about it in the future. Uh, you will recall that um, the CSCT program is an important program for us. It's a school-based mental health program that we um, partner with Western Montana Mental Health uh, to provide in our schools. Um, the CSCT program is, is a program under the um, State Department, the uh, Department of Public Health and Human Services for the state of Montana. Um, and so I, I want you to be aware that the funding for this program is a little bit tenuous. Um, Montana, I'll just read a statement here from the Montana School Boards Association. Currently, Montana is the only state in the nation that reimburses uh, Title I, Title Three or Tier Three services um, through Medicaid, making CSCT a unique program designed to allow um, our behavior initiatives to be fully operational in Montana schools. That unique circumstance could be coming to an end. Uh, DPHHS has run into some difficulty with the Fed, federal government in terms of uh, using underlying school district spending to qualify for matching federal funds. Um, so um, DPHHS has made the announcement that they may not have any more federal funds for this program. They are seeking um, an increased appropriation from the state general fund to continue this program into the future. Um, but it's quite a bit of money, 9.6 million in 2022 and 11.8 million in 2023 from the state general fund. That means that it may or may not be approved <clears throat> with, the, with the legislative session coming up that we're in right now. So I just want you to be aware of that. Um, I will keep you posted on this. If this becomes a legislative discussion, um, I'll make sure that the board is aware of that. I do think it would be healthy for all of us to stay attuned to the legislative issues. I'll do my best to keep you apprised. Um, if you see bills that come up during the legislature that you have questions on, please, by all means, reach out to myself or, or, or Pat McHugh. Uh, but um, I also think it's probably at least one of our meetings, either the first meeting or the second meeting of every month, we should have a standing item for legislative issues. Thank you, Chair Holland. Thank you. And with that, we'll continue on the agenda. The next item is 8A1 which is to approve the second reading of revised board policy 1512, which made some changes to the conflict of interest board policy. As is indicated in the background information in the agenda, it was presented for review and discussion by the board on December 15th of last year, and it was approved for first reading and posted for public comment. Although the agenda doesn't indicate it, Tracy, I believe we did not receive any public comment on this proposed revision, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and so a copy of the policy is 
included as an attachment. And the recommendation is that the trustees adopt the revised board policy 1512, which is titled conflict of interest. First, is there any questions? Not seeing any hands up. Chair Holland, this yes. is Matt. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I uh, I just noticed this in the policy. I'm reading the bolded language on page 38, and I'm uh, um, I, I'm not sure that's reading correctly. Um, the language in the statute is perform an official act directly and substantially affecting to its economic benefit a business or other undertaking in which the trustee has a substantial personal interest. Um, I apologize for just catching it now, but I'm not thinking that's reading correctly. Okay, well, how about this as a suggestion then? If do the trust, are the trustees okay with tabling this so we can confirm that additional language so that we're um, making sure that our policy reads legally correctly? So is there a motion to table this? I motion to table. Okay, and is there a second? It looked like Trustee Algaris had seconded it. So any board discussion other than to allow Pat to clarify what he just had noted in the policy? Any public comment? All those in favor of tabling the motion until the next board meeting, please indicate by raising your hand or in Trustee Vogel's case by indicating by a verbal vote. Vogel is yes. And it looks like it was unanimous as to all trustees present. So we'll revisit that after Pat has an opportunity to make sure that our, our policy reads accurately. So then we move on to 9A1, which is under teaching and learning. And the topic is network improvement communities, pre-K-12 new faculty program. I don't know, Dr. Watson, are you going to introduce Dr. Guest, um, our director of curriculum, curriculum and instruction? And then this is an information item that she will be presenting on. Yes, thank you, Chair Holland. Um, a, a, a gr another great program um, that, that the board should um, have some knowledge of and be aware of. I'm gonna let actually let uh, Assistant Superintendent Russ Lodge um, introduce the team here because uh, um, he, he plays a pretty important role with this team as well. Mr. Lodge. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, you know, as someone who I've spent a lot of years um, in schools and school districts, uh, watching um, people try and develop programs to train new teachers. And when I came on board this summer and became aware of the quality of the program that we have here in Missoula, how it was developed and all the people that were involved, it's really kind of a best kept secret and I don't think it should be. Um, it's really, honestly, quite, quite impressive. So uh, my, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Elise Guest. And Elise is going to uh, take us down the road here a little bit with some of the integral parts. But, but it's really a quality program above and beyond what you're going to see almost anywhere else. So Elise, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Thank you, Russ. It's really exciting to be able to have an opportunity to talk about this with you. Um, when we talk about this program, it really started back in 2016-17, and I'm excited to see Melanie Charlson and Jenny Malloy here, um, who were a part of that initial group. We were invited as um, a district to join a network of community of districts across the nation to, to start to begin to address the issue around teacher retention and job satisfaction. And the reason why we are invited to join this network, networked community is because of the great partnership and um, strong relationship we have between district leadership and union leadership. And I think that's a huge testament to, um, to our district and all that we try to do to better support our kids and teachers. And so with that, this notion of a networked improvement community is all around coming together with like-minded districts to attack the, the problem around teacher retention and figure out the best ways to support our teachers and to use best practices in the field. And so from that moment, we have been able to really just hold true to those goals around how do we best support teachers so that we retain them in our district? And then more importantly, how do we ensure that they have the job satisfaction that we want, that when a teacher is in the classroom and they're working with their colleagues and their students, that they feel like they have a great impact on that student achievement. And thus we have a really strong community. And so 
it's really exciting to, to be able to talk about this with you and to introduce the rest of the community. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Casey Ballou, who is also a really integral part of this as she supports um, our two instructional coaches who are our new faculty instructional coaches. Yeah, and this is actually one of my favorite parts of being union president, and it's all thanks to the work, like Elise said, of those that came before me. Um, we definitely, you know, value our new and non-tenured faculty, and it's one of the most important things we can do because supporting those teachers has the effect of, you know, that's seen 30-fold. You know, it ripples into their classroom as they are able to better support um, students in learning, and we definitely see you know, mentees who have better experiences and better connections with mentors. And we definitely have those relationships that, that last, um, which is important as we face a national teacher shortage. We want Missoula to be one of those places where teachers want to come and they want to stay. So um, Melanie Charleston started this work. We definitely had a lot of data collecting to do. She wrote some great grants to get us started. Um, Brittany Keilman and Greg Imhoff worked together to write this big grant that we're in our second of three years in. Um, over $500,000 worth of grant money has come into this program. Uh, it's funded by the NEA. And there's an MOU signed, of course, by Mark Thane and Greg Imhoff that ensures that MCPS takes over the funding as that funding starts to trickle away. Um, and one of the big strengths of this program is absolutely seen, not just in this pandemic year, um, but as we've transitioned through a new superintendent, a new union president, and brand new coaches. Um, so, you know, thanks to the amazing and brave uh, Katie LaPointe and Brandy Thrasher O'Neill, we've got a great program to share with you, and I'm going to turn it over to them to talk through some of the details. Elise and Casey. Um, thank you, Chair Holland, for inviting us and Dr. Watson, Russ. Um, and gosh, I feel like I could just, I, it's, I'm like I'm at the Oscars. I could just keep thanking people. Um, but we are um, aware that your time is very precious. So I'm going to start my, my screen share here. Um, my name is Katie LaPointe. Um, this is my 12th year in education and my eighth year working here at Missoula County Public Schools. Um, and I am joined by the fantastic Brandy Thrasher O'Neill. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your time. Uh, tonight, we just want to give you a brief overview of the Network Improvement Community's new faculty program that um, so many fabulous people just before us told you a little bit about. But I just want to reiterate again that this is really a collaborative partnership among our national and local uh, teacher union and Missoula County Public Schools and administration, uh, which is really a forceful collaboration as you'll hear about tonight. Uh, this program is really gonna highlight some of the amazing and positive things going on in MCPS, even amidst the pandemic and so much uncertainty um, that these times seem to be bringing us. And again, how this uh, partnership between administration and the union is really helping ensure we have well-trained and supported teachers that in turn have a direct positive effect on learning for all of our MCPS students. So the first thing we want to start with is just talking a little bit about where the need for these new faculty program um, programs began on a national level. We can see that about 10% of teachers leave uh, after one year in the field and that more than 40% leave within the first five years. When we dig into why so many educators are leaving the field, we're finding that family and personal reasons coupled with dissatisfaction accounts for about 85% of this attrition rate. This makes sense when we really think about the difficult balance between time spent meeting the rigorous demands of teaching with family and personal needs, as well as sort of a lack of overall support for the steep learning curve in the education profession. And I think especially in those first years in the classroom when everything is so new. Uh, it became essential and critical for MCPS administration and the union to work together in tandem to address this issue, again, of hiring and retaining high quality educators. So our data shows that employing and retaining high quality educators does have a direct impact on student learning, which we know is really always at the heart and soul of what we're trying to focus on um, and, and improve. So this new faculty program is designed to offer more support during these critical years 
and specifically address those main factors that often lead to educators leaving the field. So Katie's gonna talk a little bit more uh, about why this high rate of turnover matters. So when we think about this high turnover rate, saying um, education, um, it does, as Brandy mentioned, show that there is a direct bit of impact on students' academic achievement. Um, it inhibits learning. And we can all agree that students are the why behind all that we do as educators. Another reason why turnover matters is that it compounds any undersupply of staff in an underrepresented or high-risk group. Um, additionally, hiring is really expensive um, and training is time consuming. Having to repeat these issues over and or repeat these actions over and over again, it really puts a strain on districts and it could signal that there are larger issues within a school system. And with those national trends in mind, we'd like to share a little bit of how that translates to our work here in Missouri. Um, so as you've heard from Elise and Casey, um, this is a story that starts long before um, us. It starts long before um, even the pandemic. Um, this has been on the NEA's mind, the National Education Association's mind since about 2015. And the work really began with the fantastic Melanie Charlson and Mark Bain. Um, and the NEA reached out to them and about 10 school districts across the nation to really dig into teacher retention. Um, as mentioned, we were selected because of our strong relationship between our labor and our management here at MCPS. Um, and then we received grant funding, as mentioned, to kick off. Um, in 2018, we hired new faculty coaches. We hired Brandy Keilman and Lindsay Morris to um, dig in, do the research, and start finding best practices on creating a new faculty retention program here in Missoula. Um, they used listening sessions, empathy interviews, and feedback loops um, with all of our MCPS employees in their first couple of years here. And that ties right into what has become a cornerstone for our program here at MCPS called Improvement Science. And um, it, it's a fascinating um, approach, and I'd love to explain a little bit more about that. Um, so improvement science, it is truly the foundation of our program. Um, it is the premise that we are continually working to improve regardless of our experience. We are never perfect. We are always growing. Um, and one way to implement this practice is through a feedback loop called a plan, do, study, act cycle or a PDSA as we lovingly call it. Um, and so in order to kickstart that loop, we are able to identify a need. For us here in Missoula, it was ways to better support our educators so that we can retain the right teachers. Once we identified the need, we created the plan. We initiated the development of our program and we put that plan into action. We decided to do it. Um, once we had our program up and running, we then collected um, data. We studied and reviewed performance indicators through, um, through quarterly um, interviews and surveys. And then once we had that data, we were able to analyze it and then act on what the results were. So we either adjusted what we were doing, we kept it going because it was working well, or we scrapped the whole thing and said, we need to go back to the drawing board. We're not supporting teachers in the way that they need. So given the unique nature of this year, we have really put this concept to the test um, and we've been very adaptive. And Brandy, if you would love to share some background information on how we've been adaptive this year, that would be great. Sounds great. So a little bit about who does the new faculty program actually support within MCPS? So we, again, support all new faculty in their first three years with MCPS is our main focus. So again, all of our non-tenured faculty. A uh, little bit of historic data, there's been an average of 64 new certified faculty hired each year since this program began, which is about 9% of our MCPS total staff. In addition, about 44% 40 of our certified staff are in their first five years with MCPS. So we have a really large percentage early on in their career. Uh, this data does exclude the current school year, which is an outlier in so many ways, as we know. Um, this school year, we've more than doubled the number of new hires, pushing upwards of 140 new faculty members to MCPS. About 60% of those have been in our brick and mortar schools and about 40% MOA. 
Um, so now that you have sort of a sense of how many and who we support, Katie's going to talk a little bit uh, about how we support these faculty members. So um, in the summer of 2020, um, we created a plan knowing that we were in the midst of a pandemic um, for how we would support our new faculty members in August. We hold an orientation where we onboard them to the district. We set up time with their one-on-one -on -one mentor and we provide them a little bit of curriculum training. Um, and so we put precautions in place. We felt that we could manage social distancing. We had a great estimate of who um, was being hired and um, we felt incredibly confident that we could pull the plan off um, given the parameters that we were working with. Um, Pandemics, however, never work the way you think they're going to. And um, the decision for us to go fully remote with our orientation was made um, one week before um, we were set to orient um, 50 staff members. So um, we, we were very flexible and Brandy is gonna share some of the ways that we um, got creative and were able to support these staff members. So uh, we included a little screenshot here of what seems to be our most familiar world these days, uh, our virtual get together here for orientation. So we shifted from our small group format to an entirely virtual format for COVID safety. Unfortunately, we did have to cancel our union sponsored luncheon due to COVID. Uh, we found some new creative ways to celebrate this year though, which has been fun. Uh, we had excellent attendance at our initial orientation with 93% of the new faculty that were hired as of August 17th attending. But the biggest unique and continually cha continual challenge we face the school year is how to support more than 73 additional new hires after we already had gone through our initial August orientation. So we want to talk about what actually happened in August and beyond. Um, we, to, to support the staff that were hired after our, our August orientation, again, which ended up being a bit more than half of our total new hires, we continue to offer intense onboarding support for the, at least the first seven weeks of school. And this onboarding support included an MOA specific orientation in mid-September. And for those new hires that were brought on after September, we provided just a multitude of one-on-one -on -one orientations between Katie and I. And it really still continues to be an ongoing process that we're refining as we're looking at a bump, again, increase in hiring here as we start second semester. So we know that MCPS needed the ability to be extra nimble and flexible this year with all of the curveballs we've encountered to try to meet the needs of all of our students and staff and the, com the community. And the new faculty program was one cornerstone that really did help make that possible. Um, on onboarding support, however, is just one component of our new faculty program. And it's really the continued support throughout the school year that is really at the heart and soul of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and what our mentors and mentees really count on us for the most. So we offer this ongoing support for all faculty, again, in their first three years with MCPS. And this year that includes over just almost 250 MCPS faculty right now. And it's really a number that just continues to grow. So how do we offer this other continued support throughout the school year? Um, we offer the opportunity for faculty to attend optional work sessions. Uh, these sessions are offered twice a month and they uh, provide a place to connect newer faculty with guest speakers and a variety of breakout room topics for continued support and learning. And you can see some of that listed here. Uh, survey data from previous school year had indicated that work sessions were incredibly valuable. And so this year, uh, the new faculty program, we're offering twice as many work sessions for a total of 16 of them over the course of the school year. So far, we've had an average of over 40 new non-tenured faculty attending each of our optional work sessions, and we're about halfway through those 16. Uh, these work sessions are a great way for new faculty to connect with us as instructional coaches and with each other as they're really navigating the education profession and MCPS. Uh, work sessions also provide another way for uh, our program to collect data to continue to inform what we can do to continue to adjust and uh, improve that support that we offer through that improvement science and those PDSA surveys that Katie was talking about. So Katie's gonna share a bit of the data that we have collected so far this year from the work sessions that we've hosted. 
Yeah, so um, after each work session, we do have a brief um, survey that we send out. Um, and we ask three questions about the session and how we can improve the events moving forward. It is the study and act portion of our cycle. And 98% um, of the exit tickets so far this year have indicated that um, these work sessions provide value in supporting our non-tenured faculty. Over 93% report that the information they got at a work session would continue to be helpful moving forward, whether that is information from Hatton on district communication or um, from one of our fantastic teachers at Porter providing information on trauma-informed practices to um, you know, hiring um, and health benefits from our fantastic folks over at Human Resources. Um, additionally, um, 95% have shared that having these guest speakers come in is an efficient and helpful way to gain knowledge about various district, district initiatives and topics. Um, there is so much to onboard our staff with. And previously we were having kind of a crash course day. We called it, um, our, um, it was the orientation part two, um, induction day. And um, we found that in shifting to having these guest speakers come in during work sessions, it's actually a beneficial way for them to get a small bite, take in the information, process it, have a contact to um, follow up with and um, just synthesize that district information in a, in a more meaningful way. Um, so that's some of the ways that our work sessions are supporting our non-tenured faculty. But the program also benefits our experienced faculty members as well, as Brandy will explain. So you can probably tell we really like to dig into data and really do use it to drive and inform how we can offer this, this program and excellent support with all the people that help collaborate. So we also gather quarterly data about the new faculty program from our mentors, from our more veteran teachers that are helping support the newer faculty. And we, I, would, I just wanna note that these survey questions, they're really short, like four questions, that they're open-ended questions. They aren't given a preset, um, choices to select. But here you can see that over 50% of our mentors report that they're learning new instructional practices from their mentee. Um, just those reminders of positivity and grace. Uh, myself included, I think sometimes when you've uh, been down in the trenches for a while, uh, it's refreshing to see some of the new things that our new faculty bring to MCPS. So I, this data just really emphasizes the program not only positively impacts our new faculty, but also many of our veteran teachers and all of those students combined that are touched by all of these faculty and all those academic ways. Um, so Katie's gonna talk now a little bit about some of the increased support we offer for specifically our first year new hires in MCPS. Yeah, so while we offer our support for all of our non-tenures through work sessions and coaching, we do offer increased support for our year one new faculty, which would be people who are in their first year with our district. Um, and that starts with providing a one-to-one -one mentor match based on key criteria, whether that is um, being close to their grade level assignment or their content area. And um, even more importantly, it's someone who is, if possible, in their physical building. Um, and those specific criteria allow these mentors to be in the trenches, go-to point people. They're able to provide daily check-ins with the mentees or um, at least weekly check-ins. Um, they also are able to work through a quarterly action item checklist. Um, it gives them kind of the key points that they're gonna wanna watch out for during the quarter, whether that is prepping for parents for conferences or um, making sure that they are doing lesson planning or doing some um, gearing up for assessments that are coming. Um, and then these mentors also provide crucial emotional and institutional support um, on a regular basis, to people right there um, in the building with them. So in addition then to orientation and onboarding that we talked about, those optional work sessions and the one-on-one -on -one mentoring specifically for year one, uh, we also offer a menu of other coaching options for all year one, two, and three faculty. So you can see a list of some of these coaching supports that we offer. This really, again, is the meat of our program, the day-in, day-out stuff. Uh, one of those is learning walks. 
this really does take professional learning right to the classroom. So during a learning walk, teachers will visit several other classrooms with a coach to observe student learning. And the cool part is that, that they get to self-identify some instructional practices that they want to incorporate into their own classrooms. So for example, I recently went on a learning walk with several MOA teachers who were wanting to gather some ideas on how to just better engage students in those virtual classrooms. And we were able to observe uh, students engaging in Pear Deck and breakout room discussions and a variety of other collaborative, collaborative activities and virtual classrooms we visited. And now these teachers are, were able to see those activities in action, watching students engaging in them. Uh, and now they will have that opportunity to take those back to their own classroom uh, and students for some implementation to continue to improve their own instructional practices. Um, and often these learning walks will then lead to a one-on-one -on -one coaching cycle where we can continue to work with faculty to help them just fine tune um, their new practices. And, and it really has a very positive direct impact on student learning. So all of these professional learning op opportunities and, and the others you see listed here focus on, again, that improvement science and the PDSA cycle that Katie talked about and drive our mission of continual improvement regardless of the amount of experience we may or may not have in education. Uh, so in the next slide, Katie just can talk about a couple other resources that we also have for our faculty. Yeah, so we, we provide orientation, we provide mentors, we act as coaches, um, and then this is kind of the hidden gem of the program. <laughs> um, it's our new faculty website. So um, we have created a, um, in a very extensive faculty website, which is not only useful for our newest faculty members, but we have um, gotten feedback that it's useful for veteran teachers as well. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I used it before I was part of the program. Um, it is a one-stop shop full of resources including the new faculty program guide, both for our mentors and our new faculty members. It has the checklist that I mentioned for quarterly action items. It has um, video tutorials on everything from how to set up your voicemail to creating a staff web page. Um, we hold all of our new faculty monthly newsletters on this website for them to reference. And there's so much more. Um, and it is a public facing website. You're welcome to go check it out. Um, this spring, our staff members, both new and tenured, have reported that this page was their go-to for remote learning. Um, the department was able to create screencasts and tutorials, step-by-step -step written guides, and so much more to help the transition to remote learning and to vet resources to support um, our, our move to tech-heavy instruction. Um, so this is something that we're really proud of and we love that we're able to support all of our MCPS teachers this way. Um, but because it is public facing, it does get some other hits as well. So um, we have shared and developed this specifically for Missoula County Public Schools, but we also are able to connect um, our new program, our new faculty program with um, both people across Montana and across the country. Um, the Carnegie Foundation is a leading organization for improvement science practices across the United States. And um, our new faculty coaches and our network improvement community, we were able to attend the summit in 2018. And then they were invited back to present both in April of 2019. And then again, during the virtual summit that was held in April of 2020. Then this past fall, we were selected to present three, three sessions at the Montana Federation of Public Employees Educator Conference. So we were, we are super proud to support our fellow Missoula educators, but we also get to share our improvement journey on a much broader scale. And continuing to keep that improvement journey in mind, um, Brandy's gonna share some of the most recent feedback that we've received about our program and our ability to be responsive. Thanks, Katie. So to kind of wrap up um, what our program is, all about, we thought we'd share a little more data from our most recent survey um, on the left from mentors and on the right from our mentees. And to just really reiterate that our goal is always to give people what they want and what they need. 
Um, and again, here's our most recent PDSA data asking both mentors and mentees to give us feedback on the new faculty program and what they need coming up, moving forward into semester two. And this data really overwhelmingly shows the need for continued support. And again, these are open-ended questions that we dig through to find patterns and data. So um, we can see that that is definitely something that they need with a few other very specific needs as well. So we're just always working to be agile and adapting to meet the specific needs of MCPS faculty so that we can support and again, retain the right teachers. So that being said, we just like to leave you with a quote, quote that really does encompass the big focus, again, of our new faculty program and how it directly impacts the learning of all of our MCPS students. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, and just thanks for, for listening. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks. Um, I'm looking to see if any trustees have any questions. I just want to thank you for that thorough presentation. It's always so valuable in knowing when I was on the school board, when this, um, I don't know what the right term is, when this came up with um, Melanie and Mark Thane and people traveling to various places for training, that we now get to see that MCPS has really made it robust. You know, you hear about these training programs that they were going off to, but we got to hear tonight what it's become. So I really appreciate hearing about the fact that it, it's a living, breathing um, protocol in our district. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll look to see if any trustees have any hands up for any comments or questions. I'm just going to I don't see any. I don't it's, see any either right now, Chair Holland. Okay. And I think that's because of the fact that it was it was very well prepared. So thank you so much. And then it's information only, but I didn't know if there's any public comment on this information item. I'll look for hands up there too. There's a person, um, Jamar Galbra, who has a hand up. Go ahead and unmute and provide public comment. Again, we ask the comments be limited to three minutes to be respectful of everybody's time. So go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for uh, this project and for your work on this. Um, and I'm just curious um, in terms of your data uh, collection and usage and things like that. Um, just wondering about um, how your information or how you receive your information regarded to like demographic information, such as race, ethnicity, and utilizing that both um, for recruitment and retention purposes, um, as well as for uh, pairing with uh, like mentor, uh, mentor and mentee. And just to let everyone know, public comment is a, the opportunity for members of the public to make comment. But if you wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I would suggest you start with Dr. Watson, and then he might refer you to an appropriate person to um, have a, a deeper conversation. But thank you for your comments. And then I see Melanie Charlson has her hand up. Go ahead, Ms. Charlson, and Thank unmute yourself. Thanks so much, Chair Holland. Um, Melanie Charlson here. I'm with MFPE. I'm thrilled to see the updates. Um, I had a smile on my face the entire time throughout the process. Uh, this was really um, such a project near and dear to my heart in my time with MCPS. And it's just wonderful to see it continuing and thriving and growing and having such a vast um, impact, yes, across the state and, and across uh, our region. Um, I did attend those three sessions during MFPE's Educator Conference in October. Uh, MCPS was well represented. Thank you so much for those presentations. And then I've received in my position as a field consultant a, a substantial amount of inquiry. So I know once we get to a little bit more normal times, um, we can have maybe some broader conversations with MCPS leading the way into feeder schools and other areas, schools in our region. So bravo and thank you so very much for this continued work. Much appreciated. Thanks. Any other public comment? I'm just looking for hands up. I'm not seeing any at this time. Okay. Well, again, thank you for taking time to um, present to us because 
it really is nice to see since I was on the board in the initial stages to just see what it's become. So thank you, thank you to everyone who's been involved with this from the beginning to now. So thanks so much. And with that, we'll go back to agenda item um, 9B, which is under new business, which is business and operations. And Pat, I know the background information in the agenda is pretty complicated. So I understand we're presenting this as an information item tonight so the trustees can get some background information and it will probably come forward as an action item at a, a later date, but it's, it's a, an interesting partnership. So if you wanna take it away and explain what um, supporting the city's grant application to the Land and Water Conservancy Fund program for improvements to Lowell Playground at Westside Park is all about. I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Chair Holland. Uh, so, as mentioned, there's there's quite a bit of background in the uh, attached to the agenda. I will sort of summarize some of the the, the basic background information. Um, Lowell School and the adjacent Westside Park sit on property that's owned by the school district. Um, the Westside Park property is leased to the city and has been leased to the city to operate uh, the playground. Um, as a park. And so uh, essentially under the terms of the 30 year lease with the city, we use the, uh, the playground adjacent to Lowell uh, School for playground purposes uh, during the, the school day. And uh, parts of the park are, are fenced off for available um, uh, community to use during the school day, but otherwise it's first use is for our, our students. And then, um, and then the playground is available for use by the neighborhood and the community uh, in the evening. And I understand it's it's extensively used. The um, the playground was originally the current playground structure was originally built in 1998. It uh, was largely built out of the efforts of the neighborhood um, and fundraising efforts uh, within the community. It's a uh, wooden structure that has um, exceeded its original useful life of, of 20 years. And so um, a, uh, an effort is underway to, to replace the playground with more up-to-date equipment. And um, hopefully you have had an opportunity to look at the Westside Park Project um, website. It's linked in the, uh, the background to this agenda item, but um, uh, there's there's quite an undertaking by um, various uh, groups, uh, including the North Missoula Community Development Corporation, uh, Friends of Missoula Parks, the the Lowell uh, Neighborhood Association, uh, to as well as the city and MCPS to fundraise in support of the playground improvements. Um, as the the lessee of the of the of the playground of the park. Uh, the city is proposing um, application for a grant. As Chair Holland mentioned, this is a, a grant that's through the Department of, in, in, of the Interior through the Land Water Conservation Fund program grant. These grants have been around since the 1960s. They provide funding to support outdoor space and outdoor recreation, um, picnic areas, playgrounds, um, any outdoor recreation space. And so the, uh, the timing here is, is such that the, uh, the grant runs November to November, but it's, it's sort of a first come first serve basis. The first application deadline is March 1st. The city is hoping to get in, in front of that application. It's a very detailed, um, very detailed application. And um, part of the application requirement for us and for you as trustees, as owner of the property, is to um, adopt a resolution in support of the grant application if that's if that's the direction you want to go. And um, the the significance here is that the uh, the fundraising effort has available um, about five hundred thousand dollars that could be used as matching funds. This includes funds that have been set aside by our district, $100,000 from our bond proceeds to support playground improvements. Uh, the city has set aside $350,000 and then we've, the, the, the 
fundraising group has um, obtained a, a significant grant. And so there are funds that are available as matching funds. Um, uh, the application for the grant could would be between four hundred and five hundred thousand um, dollars. As as reflected in the grant application summary, as well as the resolution, part of this grant requires that the that the property that's subject to the improvement um, be maintained in perpetuity for outdoor recreation space, and that's reflected in the the grant summary. It also requires that in perpetuity the space be be um, maintained without encroachment except for encroachments that further the park. So you could have maybe the addition of a, um, of a, of a picnic shelter or that type of thing, but, but you couldn't um, encroach the property with, with roads or with other buildings or structures. Um, I didn't include this in the background section, but, but we'll mention it that the, the law, the federal law requires the ability to convert the property. Um, and what that means is that um, that restriction, the perpetuity, um, the, the maintaining it in perpetuity could be lifted if you're able to offer replacement property that's, that's of equal value, um, that is of um, a corresponding um, benefit. And it doesn't have to exactly be the same size, but the equal value is important and the location would also be important so that it's in close proximity to where this, this space was at. Um, I, I'm uh, just learning about these grants. The city is much more familiar with these grants having applied for and received a number of them. In talking with, with the city, they have converted a number of, of properties that were benefited uh, by grant proceeds. Um, but I, I don't think you go into this type of um, grant application with the idea that 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 conversion is is available um certainly it is available but but uh i, I think given the restrictions you want to go in knowing that that property is going to be set aside for this purpose um as uh, outlined in the, in the grant um in terms of the attachments to the agenda, uh, page 40, you have a grant application summary. It, it provides some of the information I just went through. Page 41 is, is an older depiction of, of our property and, and you can't really see it because it's black and white, but the upper half of the diagram is the portion that's part of Westside Park. And you have kind of an odd jag around a building on the right side about in the in the middle of that boundary and that's partnership health center so that 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 building would be excluded from the from the boundary map that would be used as part of this grant application summary um, or grant application by the city the bottom half of the diagram on page 41 is is the old lowell building so you'll notice it doesn't doesn't look like it does today but uh it it reflects the space that wouldn't be subject to the grant. So the portion, the upper half of about a two acre parcel of property is what would be subject to the, the grant uh, um, for improvement purposes and restriction purposes. Um, then, uh, then there's a draft resolution that's attached beginning on page 42. It also includes some of the same background I just went through. Page 43, it, it reflects a, uh, resolution, the uh, um, and there's a mistake there. It says that the board acknowledges the contract placed against the leased property. That actually should be the constraints, and the constraints would be the the restrictions uh, on use um, in perpetuity. Then page 45. This is something that you've seen when we when we went over the lease agreement. Um, this is the master plan. Um, there's actually an excellent um, uh, depiction of this on the website under Westside Park Projects. Uh, you can go into this master plan and, and see the various improvements that are that are proposed. Um, it's 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 pretty impressive. Um, the uh, plan, if you look at the on page 45 about uh, looking at Lowell School and, and heading. Um, 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 this would actually be heading east, but going <laughs> going up on the page, 
you'll see the sport courts, which would be uh, an improvement. These would be a basketball court, pickleball courts, um, and the like, up to a one full court and a couple of half court basketballs, basketball courts, plus uh, the availability, the availability of pickleball. Um, continuing that direction, there's a, a um, also a preschool playground area, a splash deck. There's an area for Lowell Mountain in the middle of the of the playground, and then a, a climber um, uh, structure. So that the if you look at that link and that website, the the planned improvements are in the two million range. Uh, the fundraising to this point is as well as the government contributions are in the 740, 750,000 range with ongoing work continuing. Um, it's an, it's an impressive, um, planned improvement. Um, it's, uh, it's, a uh, it's an impressive effort, um, by these groups to, to raise funds and to look to the community to support the, this neighborhood playground. So, um, with that, I would, I would, try and answer any questions that I could. Um, I do have one question first and then I'll check with other trustees. You indicated there's some federal law that would be applicable to substituting comparable um, land use and uh, moderately the same size. Would that be something that would be prudent to include in the resolution or because it's in, I don't know if it's a state or federal statute that since that is by, I mean, since that, impacts it, this, would there just need to be a resolution or a reference to the statute? Or do you think that's unnecessary? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I, I gave that some, some thought it, uh, and, and did talk to the city about it uh, briefly. The, uh, the inclusion wouldn't um, do anything more than acknowledge it, but it, we certainly could. And I don't think it's um, a bad idea to do so. They acknowledge that, that, that um, conversion requirement uh, does exist. Um, and as you'll note in the resolution, I also include the ability of the board to reserve the right to, to approve the, the award. And I think that's important. Um, and it's important because the, the way that the grant works, it doesn't matter what the amount of the award is, the entire property that's identified as subject to the grant would also be subject to the um, restrictions, the limitations on on uh, development of the property and um, use beyond the outdoor recreational use. So, a I, I'm making up these numbers. A five thousand dollar grant, you would have a restriction that would apply to that whole West Side playground. And uh, so, it's important to be able to reserve the ability with the city to approve the grant. Now, in talking with the city, that it, it's not going to be a, a, it's a grant of that, of that, uh, of that amount. If awarded, it's going to be a pretty sizable grant, and the request will be sizable. It'll be four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. But on your point, Marcia, I would think, or Chair Holland, I think it would be worthwhile to, to just add it as an acknowledgement, and I'll make a note to that. Okay, and then Trustee Mercer has his hand up. Go ahead, Trustee Mercer. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is the. Uh playground where my son first slid and where he still goes to school. So it's, uh, I'm glad to see all this effort. Um, I guess my question is about the maintaining outdoor in perpetuity. I know the princip principal Frank has desired to have some controlled access to the playground during school hours. That doesn't conflict. Is that we can, we don't have to allow access all the time just as use. Yeah, excellent question. And, and I had the, uh, the same thought. Um, our lease agreement, though, which includes that restrictive ac access is going to be attached to the grant application. So in instances where a school district is, is partnering with a city like here, you either file an interlocal agreement, or in this case, we had file a 30-year lease agreement. So those restrictions would be part of the grant application. But, but great point. Any other questions, Trustee Abgaris? Thank you, uh, Pat. I'm curious. Uh, there's a few parts to this, and the topic support for cities, the city's grant application. Um, obviously, this isn't something we're voting on. So it's just kind of a, an informational. But 
The part where it talks about uh, funds committed by MCPS from the bond proceeds uh, to support the match the grant from LWCF, is that something that we would be voting on as well? Is that something that we've committed already? How much is that? What, what is that part? So, so that amount is, has been committed and it's $100,000. And uh, it, it's comparable to uh, investments that we've made in playground equipment in other schools. Um, if you look at site work at other schools, there, there's been examples with bond proceeds that we've invested more. Um, I've put a bug in, in Burley's ear about increasing that if, if we're able to, and we can talk a little bit about where we're at with the bond proceeds later, but, um, but at this point, that's the amount we have committed is the, is the 100,000. And so, so Trustee Mercer, let me see if any other trustee has a question. And if not, I'll come back to you for your for a question. Not seeing other hands up, so go ahead, Trustee Mercer. And I suppose a little bit in the form of a comment, just as a parent at the time, we when we had the bond remodeling, which was all great, none of that went to the playground. We're the only school where in this unique thing where our school playground is on a city lot, and so and it didn't get anything out of the city parks bond, and it kind of just fell through both cracks. And so that's I think why I'm hoping there's this. This effort's being made to kind of, I think, fix some of that falling through the cracks that happened. And just to clarify, I, let me ask Pat a question. We actually own the land. It's the city that leases the land. So it's, it's still our land. It's just, um, you know, the city's operating under a lease. And so that's the reason at some point we, the board would probably need to make a decision about any other commitments that bind the use of the property. Is that right, Pat? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Any other trustee questions? Not seeing any hands up. And this is information only, so I'd, we won't be taking any action on it tonight. Any um, public comment? Heidi West has her hand up. Um, Ms. West, go ahead and unmute. And we, again, ask to keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Heidi West. I'm the Project Westside Park Coordinator for the North Missoula Community Development Corporation. I also represent Ward 1, which includes about half of the Lowell service area on the Missoula City Council. And most importantly, I'm a mom of two and a Lowell parent. So all of my roles converge on this project. And I want to acknowledge the hard work and funding commitments that have already been put towards this effort of rebuilding the West Side Park. Um, so to date, we have $770,000 committed to this project and the preschool playground is currently under construction and will be opening this spring. And that playground is going to be open to the public um, all of the time, uh, not just uh, when Lowell's out of session. So. Um, the land and water conservation funds are a significant potential funding source for this park and the land and water conservation fund also guarantees that this much loved park remains a public space into perpetuity. Access to this sp space is vital to the neighborhood, um, which is already characterized by less than desired parkland density. It is also seeing strong development pressure with two low income housing tax credits, projects that are going to be constructed in the Lowell service area and the neighborhood overall is characterized by poor health outcomes. So securing this park as an active outdoor space into perpetuity is to the benefit of current and future, future Lowell students, um, neighborhood residents and the community as a whole. So thank you for considering this item. Thanks. Any other public comment? And again, we'll be taking public comment when it comes back as an agenda item. I'm not seeing any other hands up, Patton, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, well, thank you for that information. And now we'll move on to two, which is to approve an intercap loan. Um, and we discussed this back in November about buying a replacement vehicle for Sealy Swan because their vehicle wasn't really serving its purpose. So Pat, um, there's a resolution that we now need to adopt to help fund 
um, the purchase of the vehicle, which I assume already has happened. Uh, thank you, Chair Holland. Yes, that's exactly right. This is the uh, the final the final step. Um, we uh, we can schedule a closing with uh, the Department of Commerce um, once this resolution is is approved by the board. And the resolution is on page forty six. It, it it looks a lot like the resolutions that that you all uh, looked at, approved, and and signed uh, when we are going through the bond process. Um, it's it's uh, it's authorizing um, uh, Marsha as a school district official to to execute the the resolution, which authorizes the signature of the loan documents. Um, the the loan amount is outlined in the background section. It's twenty five thousand dollars. The the terms are very good. Um, there it's a variable rate loan, which adjusts with uh, inflation. But right now it's it's at 2% or just over 2%. Um, and what, uh, um, what I anticipate is that the, uh, the Sealy budget will, will be able to support um, that, that servicing and, and also with support from the, the district budget. But um, uh, this is uh, something that, that timing wise worked out fairly well from Sealy standpoint, because uh, last budget year, they were not expending um, uh, much of their allocation of budget, and we were able to preserve that through the multi-district agreement at the end of the year, and that's the, the funds that they had available here to apply against this purchase. So we've uh, made half of the purchase price already, and we'd look to, to fund 25000 with this intercap loan. Any questions for Pat? Not seeing any hands up. I don't see any hands either. So um, the recommendation is that there is a motion to adopt resolution 2021-4S. Is there such a motion? Moved by Trustee Vogel. Is there a second? Second by Trustee Apgaris. I saw his hand first, sorry, Trustee Hoppins. And so we have a seconded motion. Is there any board comment or discussion? I will just offer that I'm glad we were able to do this because as we heard at the earlier meeting, the number of uses that that vehicle will be put to in Sealy Swan. So it's, it's a, a very valuable asset to that high school. So thanks for helping work on this. Path. Chair Holland, I think um, Trustee Vogel would like to make a comment. Great, Trustee Vogel, go ahead and unmute. Um, thank you. I um, Actually, I just hit the wrong button. And so I'm sorry, I don't have a comment. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Any other trustee comments? Not seeing hands up. Any public comment on this item? On the motion? I, mean, I don't see any. Seeing any hands up. So all trustees in favor of approving the intercap loan, please indicate by raising your hand or trustee Vogel, if you would unmute and um, express your vote. Vogel is a yes. So that motion passes unanimously. And then we move on to three, which is the Lowell Elementary School as a community center, which is an elementary action item. So Pat, if you want to explain what's going on at, element, at Lowell Elementary in terms of serving as a community center. All right, thank you, Chair Holland. And, and uh, um unintentional that there are two Lowell items, but just happened to work out that way. And uh, uh, this is um, an intralocal agreement that we're asking the board to approve. And an intralocal agreement is a unique statutory arrangement between two government entities, whereby they bring together their uh, separate resources for the collective good. And here the collective good would be for the benefit of our, our students and the neighborhood and the community of, of Lowell. And um, this, this follows um, really a, a, a long standing and, and successful relationship with the city in terms of the operation of Westside Park. And also the, uh, the efforts of the Parks and Rec Department in working with Lowell School in providing some 
some uh, excellent programming uh, and uh, and the interest of the community and the neighbors in having um, a space for for families, for neighbors, um, in in a variety of ways, uh, support for job applications, support uh, from a food delivery and availability standpoint. Um, the uh, th this effort was. Um, uh, includes a variety of partners. They're actually listed at the bottom of the page on page 50 under that whereas clause. And you'll see uh, just the number of organizations that have that have come to bear in terms of supporting the uh, this uh, this effort. And and this is really the beginning. This is just the start. Um, we're not able to really offer the the school for community programming. Uh, at the present time, we we offer after school programming for for students, but uh, in midst of the COVID uh, era, we haven't opened up really any of our schools for for much in the terms of evening programming. So this will that delay, I guess, will provide the uh, the um, advisory group that would also be formed under this interlocal agreement the opportunity to to develop their bylaws, to identify their members, and to come up with um, some of the background efforts that they would make to ensure the success of, of, this, of this arrangement. Um, the, the agreement that's uh, attached, as mentioned, begins on page 50. I'll just maybe point out a, a few things. Um, um, so, so the first recital, the first whereas clause talks a bit about the interlocal agreement and and really captures it verbatim from the statute. The, uh, um, the, the uh, intent of the, of the agreement is to provide an experienced qualified um, uh, department in the, in the parks and rec department, the opportunity to provide the, the oversight and the coordination, the program coordination and they're particularly skilled and and um, and funded in that area. So, um, unlike um, uses that that happen in a variety of our facilities, and not meant to disparage any of those uses, but uh, but here the the effort would be under uh, real specific site supervision and um, real specific programming efforts and. Uh, and uh, to that end, I would, I would have you look to the, uh, to the end of the agreement. I'm kind of jumping from the front to the end, but you'll see uh, exhibit, exhibit B, um, or excuse me, exhibit A reflects the mission and guiding principles um, that really was the spearhead toward this, this effort. And uh, these, uh, the mission and, and guiding principle is, is, sort of foundational to how this local agreement and arrangement was put together. Um, the agreement itself, if you look through it, calls for for the city and for MCPS uh, to work together to coordinate custodial services, maintenance, scheduling of programming, and um, and the like. The first and fundamental priority is, is for our school to operate as a school. So that'll be in Incorporated within the agreement, that is that is the first priority and and must be. Um, but their uh, their after school programming will um, will continue to take place, and then additional community programming would would then be uh, offered beyond the hours of the after school programming. Um, the term of the agreement is is for five years. Um, subject to the ability of the parties to review and and um, provide feedback. Um, as mentioned, we've worked with the city and with the parks department and and based upon that past relationship, really believe that that we'll be able to cooperate and work together to um, to address any um, any and, and all issues that might arise. I, I think um, there's just so many unknowns with this venture, and and uh, I think uh, um, there'll be a lot of of working through the details of the venture as as it progresses. But I think uh, 
the opportunity and the intent is is service to our students, to the neighbors, and to the community, and and to our students' families. So um, I I expect to see some real positive outcomes, um, and uh, I think. There has been just with uh, the involvement of Parks and Rec and after school programming. Um, so I would be happy to answer any additional questions that you may have. Pat, I'll ask the first question, then I'll check with trustees about other questions. So if I understand it, it's for a term of five years, but the governing rules and et cetera haven't been fleshed out yet. So does the time start now if we pass the resolution? And even though understanding that some of the details may take a while. Um, to yes, good question. I'm sorry I meant to mention that. So this, this agreement still has to go through city council. Oh, okay. Um, we still have some, some minor edits that aren't reflected in the document that you're looking at. Um, uh, that, that we've been working through, um, one with uh, both our respective insurance carriers on the insurance language, but then also just some minor language about uh, custodial support. And I think uh, um, in talking with uh, the director of the Parks and Recs Department, it, it sounds like they have plans to have this in front of council uh, in February. And so um, once we uh, approve, um, you know, with the board's permission, we could make some minor editing changes to the agreement and then then the, it could be presented to the city council by the city parks department. Thanks. And so just one quick follow up question. So if anything came up that you perceived and Dr. Watson perceived as substantial as opposed to minor, it would come back to the board. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Any other trustee questions of Pat? Not, oh, Trustee Abgaris? Yeah, just a quick question, just clarity here. So this is obviously an excellent program um, and an excellent idea, but this is inviting community members into our building while we're still in phase two. Is that correct? It's not. No. So no, we, we wouldn't initiate any programming until we're, we're opening up the schools for community uh, use for volunteers and that and the like. So it, it's, uh, um, I think that the real interest by the city is that they've budgeted a significant amount in support of this program. And so they, they want to make sure that an, an agreement with MCPS exists behind that budget. And, uh, and so it's, it's important for that purpose. And then for for the group that's that's working this to feel like uh, it's going to happen, so they can start developing programming and, and start putting the pieces together. But no, they there wouldn't be actual community programming happening. Any other trustee questions? I'm not seeing any hands up. So the recommendation is that um, that K twelve trust these approve the interlocal agreement that's found as an attachment to our agenda. Is there such a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Decker. Is there a second? Seconded by Trustee Abgaris. Is there any board discussion? Trustee Decker. And then I think it must be, and then Trustee Mercer. Um, so I want to just share that um, I've, in, in the capacity of my day job, I've had the opportunity to participate in some of the working group discussions that have brought this project to this um, spot. And I just wanna make sure that people understand that this is, um, this is the foundation that will allow um, a community center to continue to take shape with the involvement, first and foremost, of course, of the principal of Lowell and the Lowell school staff and community and MCPS administration, but also with the involvement and guidance of neighbors, um, of community members, of people who live on the north side, west side, and of community organizations and nonprofits beyond parks and recreation that lots of different voices, including the food bank, Garden City Harvest, many other really valuable community partners have been part of that conversation. 
Um, it's incredibly encouraging to see so many organizations come together to support the North Side, West Side neighborhood and Lowell School community um, specifically. That's been just a really fantastic process. And I can't say enough about how um, enthusiastic um, Barb Frank, the principal at Lowell has been about this process. In fact, she's really been in the lead on, um, on encouraging this process to happen. It's been more than a year in development. And of course, COVID has thrown a wrench into the works for, <laughs> for everything. Um, but with the investment on the part of the city to make this um, sort of building this foundation, um, there's really a lot that could happen. And the hope of folks that I've heard talking is that this could also serve as a model for other parts of our district or parts of our community where this kind of support to kids and families is really needed. Um, it's an intergenerational model. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a 21st century model of thinking about schools. Um, and so I just have to express my gratitude that this project has come to this point. It's taken tremendous work on the part of everyone. Pat, not the least of which, um, I know Pat has put in a tremendous amount of time with Donna Gockler and others to get this together. And I just wanna um, express strongly how enthusiastic I am about the project. Thanks, and Trustee Mercer, then Trustee Lorenzen, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, so I just wanna steal all that and double down on that as well. Um, just a couple particular things I think, uh, Parks and Rex has, uh, <coughs> I don't know, they've really been there for little families this year, so I appreciate that. And, and Principal Franks just shows that, that someone with a lot of energy and drive and passion can make things, can change the world, so. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a wonderful partnership between the school district and the schools. I think it's a it's very important to see us focusing within our community. I think COVID changes things. And I think we all noticed that when the world came to a standstill, it was great to be in Missoula, Montana, and a lot of people are trying to be here. And so I'm hoping this model, I'm sure this model will also also be considered for places like the 6th Street Administration Building, where instead of just locking it up into private ownership and you know possibly even corporate ownership, we we'll keep it and talk to the city and figure out how to use it as a community um, in, in all, a lot of similar ways. So thank you everyone for that work. Any other trustee want to make comments? Not seeing any hands up. Um, I'll jump in here, although I won't be voting on it because I'm a high school trustee, but wearing a different hat, I'm in a Kiwanis club in Missoula, and I've been working with Barbara Frank to help support Lowell School. It's a school that my Kiwanis group really supports, and I've, I heard about this project, and I just want to echo what everyone has said about her energy, her vision, and her drive, and that of her staff, because you know I was in conversations with her a, quite a while ago about this was a vision that she had for this um, partnership with the neighborhood and with the city. And so I just, another shout out to the um, principal and the staff at Lowell and just know that there are other entities, other nonprofits in town who want to support this as well. So thank you. And not seeing any other trustee hands up. Is there any public comment? And it looks like Heidi West has her hand up. So go ahead, Ms. West. Um, thank you. Uh, so I am speaking on behalf of myself, um, and I introduced myself during my earlier comment, but also on behalf of my co-council member for Ward 1, Brian Von Losberg. Um, we are both Lowell parents, and Barbara invited us, um, I guess it was uh, just over a year ago, um, into a room along with many other people to start this conversation as of Lowell as a community center and I we are both so incredibly grateful for her vision and her leadership uh, the support of MCPS thus far as well as the many many community members that have brought this project uh, to where it is today um, and while I can't say how the city council will vote on it in February um, I do want to point out that during the last budget season the city council allocated $97,000 to the Lowell, 
Lowell Community Center project, um, and that is not one-time funding. Um, that is built into our base budget and will be funded into the future. So this MOA sets the foundation for the city allocated funds to be spent, um, essentially allowing this project to transition from uh, the really hard work and planning that has been happening to implementation. So I hope that um, you support this effort. Thank you. Thanks. Any other members of the public who would like to make comment, just raise your hand. And looking to see if there's any hands up. I don't see any other hands up. So a second in motion and Board comment and public um, comment have occurred. So all K-12 trustees in favor of the motion to approve the interlocal agreement in the form that's attached to our agenda, please indicate by raising your hand. Six, seven. Thanks. I'm sorry, Trustee Lorenzen's hand blended into the background color of her wall. So I needed to make sure her hand was really up there. So- Are you um, saying I'm beige? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were for a moment at least. So the motion does pass unanimously. So thank you to everyone for considering that agenda item. And then we move on to two information items. First is the bond expenditure update. Um, as trustees and perhaps the public will recall, we try to look back on how we have spent our bond proceeds to make sure that we've been good stewards of the um, trust that our community had in passing those two bonds. And so I think we're getting toward the end of bond expenditure updates, but I appreciate you um, coming forward, Pat, to give us at least one more, if not a few more updates. So I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair Holland, and, and I, I believe you're right. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing um, that we're at this point, we were in November of 2015 when the election happened and then uh, the first bond issue in January of 2016 and the second one in September of 2017. So pretty much right on top of each other. And part of our obligation under the tax laws are to expend at least 85% within three years. And that's 85% of the, the uh, our proceeds and um, we've easily done that, which is uh, you know pretty amazing when you look at the the dollars that we were talking about. The the bond issue was 88 million in the elementary and 70 million in the high school, and and you'll see from the report that that we've expended more than that, and and part of that is is bond premium, and part of it is is interest. Um, on those bond proceeds. And um, we are really winding down. Um, and so, uh, you know, save for uh, some projects that Burley and his team and the whole thing is going back to, to tackle. Um, um, we, uh, um, and, and then including the, the little playground um, investment, we're, uh, we're really at the, at the end. So, um, it's it's good to be here and it's good to be inside that uh, bond uh, window but it's it's imposed by the uh, the IRS code and and um, and so we look forward to sort of finishing these up and and uh, maybe make uh, one or two at most reports and that'll be it that's all I have thanks any trustee questions for Pat not seeing any hands up. Any public comment? Not seeing any hands up. So the next topic is a summary of expenditures of the Montana Coronavirus Relief Funds and CARES Act funds. And so Pat, this is again a re information report by you. Yes, thank you. So page 65 has a uh, expenditure recap and um, I'll be brief. The, the top column headings, um, you'll see under the elementary, there's a CARES project code 12080. And those are that's the CARES Act. That was the uh, actual first allocation of funds in, in April. That's the total allocation, uh, less the portion for the private schools. Next to that is elementary CRF. That's 
coronavirus relief funds that came through the governor's office. That's 2.8 million in the elementary. And those funds were unique in that they had an expenditure deadline of December 30th. Um, and they were, they were sort of allocated, uh, um, uh, shoot, I want to say in the summertime. So um, it, they were uh, um, a later allocation than the CARES Act funds. The high school CARES, uh, CARES Act funds 780,000 and then the CRF dollars in the high school, the 1.8 million. Um, so between the CRF elementary and CRF high school, um, you're looking at over $4 million that were ex was expended um, um, early summer through December 30th. And, and you'll see that the expenditure of CARES Act funds, which had a later expenditure deadline have been very minimal and that's intentional. We were trying to save those funds and expend the CRF dollars first with the expenditure deadline um, the categorical expenditures, this is broken down by object code. I'll just point out one mistake. If you look at the numbers that are in the second column, just next to the description of the expenses, um, 117 should be paraeducator salaries and not athletic trainers, equipment managers. Um, we didn't spend 98,000 on equipment manager, athletic training services. Um, and then the 120 object code is substitute salaries. So with that one correction, you'll see the bulk of the expenditures were in salaries and benefits. And then near the bottom or really at the bottom, you'll see an encumbrances outstanding. And that represents some Chromebooks still. So we, uh, even though there's a December 30 deadline to, to expand, um, we got some relief or the state did because of all the difficulty that all the districts in the state had getting Chromebooks. So um, we've gotten quite a few, but we still have some more that are coming in and that encumbrance will become an expenditure and, and you'll see the total expenditures um, uh, through 1230, the, the full amount of the CRF funds uh, expended and then just a small amount of CARES Act expended and you'll see there's a budget remaining of, of $2 million there uh, that's that's being extended right now to support MOA. And, and then there's a, a summary that sort of broke it down in broader categories that maybe Hatton could throw up on the uh, screen. Um, it didn't make it in the agenda, but um, happy to share it. It's, it, it's kind of an easier document to look at and follow um, breaking down the, the CRF expenditures um, by type. And so um, you'll see that the custodial PPE expenditure was 587,000. Um, significant in that expenditure was, was um, 158,000 for those plasma filters. That was the HVAC system filters that, that, that we've talked a little bit about. Uh, thanks Hatton for putting that up. Um, then um, the, the, the big one, certainly PP and E, and that's a broad category, but includes a, a lot of uh, uh, personal protective equipment um, uh, that, was, that was purchased both districts. Um, the, um, the technology expenditure, um, you'll see again, the Chromebooks, um, and this is just through December, that number will go up when we include the encumbrances, but um, the Apex Learning, uh, the School Pace, these are all software items intended to support students. Um, and then uh, dropping down the, sh the, the screen, you'll see the uh, miscellaneous staffing. So we separated out staffing for the online academy from miscellaneous staffing. And, and I think you'll recall the addition of some uh, three art teachers. Um, the emergency COVID leave, which which we covered for staff, uh, um, to ensure that they didn't that they did stay home when they showed symptoms or when they were in in quarantine, and uh, the childcare that was supported by our partners, the the Parks and Rec, the YMCA, and and uh, Campfire, and uh, they they stepped up and provided childcare for our staff, and then finally the the online academy staffing and and. Uh, certainly, that was a, a significant investment. Um, 
that we made as a district and that the board supported and, and really has um, uh, been e extremely, I'd say, well re received by those, those students and families who wanted to remain in online uh, education. So you'll just, you'll kind of see there what, what those expenditures look like, the, um, certainly the, the bulk of the expenditures. So um, I'm happy to share that, that sheet with, with you all. And, and um, it was just a, an easier to follow summary of some of the expenditures we've talked about. And that's all I have. Um, Trustee Mercer has a hand up for a question, I believe, and then I'll check to see if other trustees have questions as well. Go ahead, Trustee. Is that the total of the MOA or is there other MOA costs coming out of general funds, so to speak? I would say probably. Uh, we, uh, um, but we tried to code as many things as expenditures as we could to the CRF dollars. So uh, we set up a supply budget um, for MOA to use. We set up uh, um, any expenditure that we that we learned of that we could support um, through the CRF dollars than than we did. And uh, and it was a um, um, it, it, it's. But, but I can say that there weren't some general fund dollars that were that were used. I would say the same for our schools. I know that uh, that we tried to uh, to move expenditures um, to the CRF dollars given the the deadline to expend those funds. But at the end of the day, there there may have been some expenditures that remained in the school budgets, but but not many. We we captured we captured uh, for sure most of those. Any other? Um... Questions from trustees? Not seeing any hands up. So um, this is information only, any public comment? Again, not seeing any hands up. So we'll continue on the agenda item C, personnel negotiations and policy. The first item is to approve a wage increase for defined employees. Dave, do you want to explain um, what is being requested of the board by the administration? Absolutely. Um, you may recall back in December, we did uh, kind of an out of uh, timeline a custodial raise because of recruitment issues for substitutes. Uh, what you have before you tonight on page 66 is we revamped all of our substitute rates of A. Um, most significant uh, would be the substitute teacher rate uh, from 11.43 to 12.50 an hour. Uh, the point in doing this mid-year um, is to whatever we can help do to facilitate uh, recruitment and getting subs in our buildings to help support us as we reopen. So um, this rate increase would be to carry us into the next year, but we're doing it literally again to help us with recruitment. Dave, can you also talk about the incentive for substitute teachers after 15 days? Um, Yes, what we were looking to do is adding uh, 50 cents an hour to raise it from 12.50 to $13 an hour after they accepted 15 uh, substitute visit, uh, jobs uh, moving forward from February 1st. The idea being again, uh, to try to incentivize people to, to take more jobs. Questions for Dave? Trustee Amgaris. Dave or Rob, either one, I'm, I'm just curious, is this enough? Is this something that we looked at competition or was there some backing to this? Is this going to move the needle for us a, a buck an hour? Um, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, hopefully it will. Um, I can tell you that within our market, this makes us very competitive. It puts us at the top end of with the local, with the other districts. So uh, we'll be offering more than others. Uh, also within that, it, it doesn't show it, but uh, for our certified teachers, I mean, our substitute teachers right now, we're guaranteeing eight hours a day. Um, so that means that they're getting uh, usually a little bit more than the 12 15 an hour would be. Um, we hope that this will increase and help with it. Um, but, um, you know, as we can imagine, some of the difficulty in recruiting subs at this point is uh, the willingness to go into the buildings. So. Any other um, questions for oh, Trustee Decker for either Dr. Watson or Dave? Go ahead. Thanks. 
Um, I will say that I was glad to see this come up. I know that several of our um, child care community partners who are um, planning to step down some of their service um, as we move back into the buildings um, had indicated that some of their staff would be taking a pay cut to substitute or work for the district um, without increases. So this is important. It does make me wonder whether we how this lines up with some of our regular staff that we rely on and depend on and actually move around in the buildings to fill um, sort of pseudo substitute roles now, especially our paras. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of comments from our janitorial staff um, in the past, and I'm curious about how we're doing in terms of parity for people who might already be in similar roles. And um, so I just want to ask about that. Um, it's a great question. We This moves us closer uh, to, but still not at the starting wages, of course, that we have for the people within those positions. Um, the other thing that is not showing up in here, but uh, uh, with our classified unit, the MMCEO, there's actually provisions written in there. So, for example, if a paraeducator fills in for a teacher or does additional subbing issues, there's actually uh, $2 add-ons an hour for those people from their regular salary. So there are incentives written within the MMCO contract to use more classified people that will help fill classroom positions if they're qualified. And Trustee Mercer has a question. Go ahead, Trustee Mercer. And I guess following up on that, I don't know which way this cuts, but also these are just flat wages with no benefits, right? That's that's correct. But I would note that though um, that our permanent sub uh, substitutes that we've been put in our buildings this year are receiving benefits, including health insurance. Any other trustee questions for either Dr. Watson or Dave? Not seeing any hands up. So the recommendation is um, that there is a motion to approve the new hourly rates for the select group of district substitutes that are identified in the attachment to our agenda. Is there such a motion? Moved by Trustee Abgaris and seconded by, um, I think it was Trustee Hobbins had her hand up. So any board discussion? Any, I'm not seeing hands. Any public comment? Not seeing any, so. Is that correct, Hatton? That's correct. Okay, so all trustees in favor of the motion to approve the new hourly rates for the identified um, district substitutes, please indicate by either unmuting and voting yes or no, or raising your hand. Vogel is yes. So that passes unanimously and all trustees are continue to be present. So then we move on to the regular personnel report and that's found on page 67. Is there anything of note that you'd like to um, point out, Dave, on the personnel report? Well, I guess I would just point out that we are, uh, you know, normally we see this the first board meeting of the month, we're now doing two this month. The reason being we wanted to ensure that some of the rate increases in things wouldn't affect by February 1st. So that's why you're seeing a somewhat smaller report um, uh, at a second meeting. We'll of course have another report for you in early February as well. Thanks. And so unless there's any questions for Dave, is there a motion to approve um, the items on the personnel report? Moved by Trustee Hobbins and seconded by Trustee Wake. Is there any board discussion? And when, again, as everyone is cautioned, we don't comment on individuals in the personnel report. Seeing no hands up. Is there any public comment? And again, with the same caution that there, there would not be any public comment on individuals in the personnel report. Seeing no hands up, then all trustees in favor of the motion to approve the items on the personnel report, please indicate by raising your hand or voting yes or no. Vogel is yes. So that motion passes unanimously. And then we reach the penultimate item on the agenda, which is to remind us about the strategic planning that we started pre-pandemic that ended up on hold after two meetings. And now we're hoping to continue to move back into that planning um, process. So there is a schedule on page 72. And Dr. Watson, if you want to 
walk us through what that plan is at this point? Yes, thank you, Chair Holland. It's hard to believe that it was a year ago uh, that we had started this process in January of uh, 2020. And um, we actually had three meetings scheduled. We had one in January, one in February, one in March. Unfortunately, we couldn't complete the March meeting, but the first two meetings we had were very well attended um, by lots of different stakeholders in the community, including um, uh, many of our um, certified and classified staff. So that, that was nice to have folks interested in the process. The process is being led by the Montana School Boards Association. I do think it's important for you all to note that the strategic plan sets the direction um, for our school district, which is um, definitely uh, the role of a school board. And so it's critically important that you're involved in this process. Um, I'm excited that it's being led by the School Boards Association. They've done this with a number of school boards across the state. Um, they have a very good process to, to arrive at a, a strategic plan that's, uh, that, that can be considered by the public and eventually approved by the board. So we will pick this up again in March. Um, Hatton has done a great job in discussing with um, the School Boards Association. Deborah Silk is our uh, lead facilitator uh, regarding these, these dates. Um, they, they may change um, just because of the nature of um, COVID and everything else, you know, they may change slightly, but we'll try to stick to these. We want to have an, uh, a few more public meetings to re-engage the public um, and get to a point where we feel like we've got a pretty good draft of the strategic plan. Um, and then that, that draft would come before the board for consideration and, and for public comment um, before, before it's approved. Uh, sort of starting with the end in mind, what, what I'd like to see is to have an, an approved plan by June, which would give us time to start thinking about uh, specific goals and objectives and strategies that we can put in place, um, not only next fall, but also throughout the school year next year. So that's sort of the process we're heading towards and starting with that end in mind, shooting for that um, June final approval date by the board so that we can start working on the plans. Thanks. Hatton, Any I don't know if you'd add anything to that. I know Hatton's been in communication with the, with the school boards association directly. I don't think I would add a ton except to just articulate that those meetings will be held virtually um, because of our COVID-19 precautions. If something amazing happens and the sky opens up and the entire state of Montana is vaccinated, I'm sure we would love to be together. But I think it's really exciting. We're all looking forward to it. And just stay tuned for outreach that helps people know when the meetings occur to re-engage. Any questions for Hatton or Dr. Watson? I don't see any hands up. I'll just add, you know, even though it was pre-Zoom and pre-COVID, the amount of public interest and public engagement at the first two meetings we had overwhelmed me. I, I, you know, Missoula is a community who cares about public education and wants to have a say in how we're moving forward as MCPS. And so it, it really was great. We had people around the side of the room who were brought into discussions. And I think that's how we might have gotten Trustee Mercer involved in the board, which is super awesome. And so I just want to say, I really appreciate all the work that Hatton did and, and everyone in the administration to make those first two groups so robust so that we hope that that will continue to take place. And maybe we'll even blow out the 300 person limit on some of our virtual meetings. And so I think Trustee Mercer has his hand up, then Trustee Decker has her hand up. So go ahead, Trustee Mercer and then Trustee Decker. Yeah, I, think, I mean, it was, a, it was a great experience and I, I'm glad it's re, reoccurring. Um, I guess I had a couple questions. I assume you're confident that um, this is enough of the meeting. I mean, 
not needing to start over from scratch, you, I guess, memorialized what was said before. I guess I would say that I heard a lot of big ideas and big thoughts. And I guess I would hope in sort of in the May time of this, that if needed, um, I, I totally understand needing to get done by June and, and get moving, but I hope there's time for big discussions if this is a big discussion moment. And it looks like that's May. And so I just hope we make room for that. Thanks. And then I think it was Trustee Decker, and then I'll check for other trustee hands up too. Trustee Decker, go ahead. Yeah, I guess just tagging on what um, Trustee Mercer just said, and given the presentation that we heard from the iValue committee earlier tonight with some very significant goals around how we approach big discussions as a district, I would be concerned about picking the process right up as if we aren't in a different place. I think the question of who was part of that 300 person meeting um, before or who was in the room before, I think should for sure be addressed. Um, and if it means that we have to go slow in order to go fast and go deep, I think we need to be willing to do that like evaluation of who was a part of that process so far and what ideas or voices have not been before we just continue moving. And I am really glad to see this coming back. It feels like we haven't been able to, to move forward because we've been in reactive mode so much. And so please don't hear that as anything other than gratitude that we're going to, but also really recognizing that if we're gonna if we're gonna walk our talk, we can't undertake a big effort like this without doing the actions that the I value group is uplifting for us. Any other trustee comments? I'll I'll just add in one, which is somewhat responsive to Trustee Mercer and, and Trustee Decker. Um, Hatton has been amazing at capturing information about who was there, what comments were made. She has been an incredible, I don't know what the right word is, there's a word to describe, a record keeper, a historian, but she really has done remarkable, um, she has made remarkable efforts to capture everything that has happened so that we know who was at the table, who wasn't at the table, and what ideas ideas came forward. So I, I just want to do a shout out to Hatton because I've seen, I've been part of the pre-planning process on this and it's pretty impressive what information is available to all of us. So thank you, Hatton. Any other trustee comments? It's an information item. See none, any public comment on this item? I'll look for hands up. Sorry, just a sec. See none. Then as we do, um, MCPS's practice is to have public comment at the beginning and end of every meeting in case someone wasn't able to get there at the beginning. So I see that um, Mr. Shearer has his hand up for public comment. And then I'll, after he's made public comment, I'll double check to see if other people would like to make public comment. So Mr. Shearer, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. My name is Ezra Shear, E-Z-R-A-S-H-E-A-R-E-R. -E -E -R. Thank you all for your uh, time and your service on the Board of Trustees. Um, today's the first day that our elementary as well as or some elementary and middle school teachers are bringing every student back uh, A through Z. So I think we should acknowledge and thank them for that. I know it's part of their job and everything, but many of them um, are doing so in an apprehensive way and some are very nervous about the consequences of that. There's still real problems regarding a full reopening plan that we have yet to solve for. And I'm looking forward to finding solutions that everybody can live with. Um, I also just wanna point out, just out of obligation, um, the Harvard Global Health Institute gave us all a lot of hope because it set out some very clear parameters for how we could reopen safely and have an operation that exists in the long run because COVID's gonna be with us for quite a bit longer. Um, and then recently today, um, JAMA released another set of data and guidelines for schools that are also very optimistic looking at the data uh, for school reopenings and low transmission rates for teachers and students. These are optimistic data points for us to look at but they come with caveats. And I feel like we're ignoring some of those caveats and I feel like we're doing so at our own peril. Um, and so when you hear from teachers 
it's because we're ignoring the if then part of this statement. And so I think we really need to pay attention for that. Um, the JAMA recommendations that came out today have very clear expectations regarding indoor sports kind of upending the system to have safe in-person schooling. And the Harvard Global Health Institute has clearly laid out guidelines on their FAQ page about how the document should be used. And the document is clearly discussed as not to be used as a justification for reopening schools. It's a set of guidelines for having an op uh, operational framework to reopen schools and maintain those schools being open safely. And I feel like it's um, especially important for the Board of Trustees to know that we cannot and are not able to meet um, all of the, the mitigation strategies that are outlined there specifically social distance within our classrooms um, at, at many, many of our levels. So saying we're maintaining three feet of social distance is not true and it's just not happening in all of our classrooms and we need to be upfront and frank about that with our community members so they can weigh those risks um, because otherwise we're not acting as public um, trustees. And, and so we have to just be forthright we're making this recommendation to reopen our schools with every student every day using the Harvard Global Health Institute guidelines that set out how to do so safely, but we're ignoring some of the aspects that say this is how you do it safely. And I think that should give us all pause. Um, thank you. I'm really excited to get back with every student every day, and many of us are. Um, but we just wanna do what the data says is safest, so. Anyway, thank you for your time and have a great night. Thank you for that public comment. Is there anyone else? Oh, there's someone who, oh, Casey Blue. Um, Ms. Blue, go ahead and um, unmute yourself and make public comment. I think uh, Ezra put so many things so well. I just wanna echo that we've got that mixture of apprehension and hopefulness within our staff. And uh, just a, a reminder too that Teachers like to be perfect, but we know no one's perfect. Um, and that reminder to keep um, at the forefront of your mind that you know safety comes first for all of us and it's not just safety for ourselves. Um, we talk about my classroom, my classroom, but what we're really trying to say is my kids. Um, so just a reminder that our work conditions are our students' learning conditions. And we're trying to make those the best that we can. Thanks. Thank you. Any other people still in the meeting who would like to make a public comment on an on agenda item? Hatton, I don't think I see any hands up. That's correct. Okay, so with that being said, we'll adjourn the meeting and I wanna thank the public, the trustees, the members of the administration, staff and teachers for all participating tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chair Holland, for leading the meeting. Thank you.